measurement upon what is incommensurable, at no time can it cut itself from the source that inspired and inspires it. In much the same way as the extravagant hypothesis, the effect of anarchy is to place the state in a multidimensional multi space in which it <coughs> finds itself torn between the extraordinary intrigue from which it proceeds and the ends it pursues, namely justice. In this perspective, the state is permanently submitted to a twofold interrogation in order to determine its legitimacy. On the one hand is the form of human coexistence established by the state in continuity with the original entry. On the other hand, does this form bring forth the end that it pursues, that is to say, justice? Moreover, this conception is oriented toward the sovereign yet descended state. The state that is submitted to the determinism that are proper of the centrifugal movement to the extent that an otherwise oriented effective is superposed on the institution. The recalling of the first entry, the anarchic proximity, and the terrors of the state justice <coughs> permits to struggle against the natural tension tendency of the state to close and recenter upon itself and to put into place a centripetal logic that brings the state to construct and reconstruct itself as a totality. This begs the question that we will leave an answer for today. What is the relationship between anarchy in the Levinasian sense of the term and the strange movement that following Levinas pushes the state in certain forms to go beyond the state. There is, however, yet another passage that helps understanding how anarchy disturbs politics. Anarchy does not reign, but it can be said. It can be speech without being sovereign speech. It must be careful not to lose its ambiguous status of an enigma that can manifest itself without unveiling, that is, an exception of a totality that leaves a trace, only a trace. This way of passing, I quote, disturbing the present without allowing itself to be invested by the arcade of consciousness, striating with its furrows the clarity of the ostensible is what we call trace. To this saying as a saying that contains the dimension of one for other is recognized the faculty of disturbing the state, the, the archist state. It disturbs the state in a radical way. That is to say, by shaking the state in its roots, in its foundation. This disturbance opens to a truly negative dial dialectics in the sense of Adorno, that is to say if we refer to the beginning of negative dialectics, another form of dialectics whose specificity is that it is set free from all affirmative essence. Since the means of negativity, or the game of negativity, ceases to produce positivity. Negative dialectics for Levinas, even if he does not use the term, because it makes possible, I quote, instances of negation without any affirmation, deliberately underlining <coughs> any affirmation. Indeed, to go to the affirmative or to the positive register would be to fall back into sovereignty, archae, and thus for anarchy too immediately ruin itself. Only moments, but crucial moments, that in their own fragility, in their non-installation in time, in the political manifestation of Arche, that is the possessor of sovereignty and reign as a totality, as a mortal god. The non-dialectical disorder is hence recognized, a disorder not proposed to order, 
not stretch in the game of ontology to disorder as a disturbance of being is recognized an irreducible sense that is the refusal of synthesis. Does this seed of folly, does this trace not come back to what Hegel criticized as Jewish folly, the attitude that refuses that universal history be the tribunal of the world, the thought that opens to an exteriority of history that is the space where one can judge it, the space within which it is possible for a saying to affirm against the state that the totality is the non-truth. Speech against the king, the archaic that reigns, speech that resolves prophetic speech, speech that in 1968 against contemporary anti-humanism was able to invent a novel and unusual relationship between humanism and honor. My conclusion, from this trajectory there emerges the singularity of Levinas. Many great philosophers of the 20th century have elaborated their thoughts with the help of a principle of anarchy. Ernst Bloch, the principle of hope, and Jonas, the principle of responsibility, Heidegger, if we follow Rainer Schumann, the principle of honor. Levinas is this uncommon thinker, resolutely modern, who explores the intrigue of the human out of any principle, at the outside of any archive, in the quest of anarchy, essential to humanity. I thank you for your attention.